Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for joining us once again. In a previous episode, we discussed a war between the Mexican Mafia and the Black Guerrilla family that began in December of 1974 and culminated with the BGF response in May of 1975. Today, we will discuss a previous battle between the MA and the BGF that resulted with them getting busy underneath the guns at the Big Q in August of 1973. But before we begin, a quick word from our sponsor. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. On August the 29th, 1973, Mexican Mafia Carnal Steve Angel Bonilla from Colonia Watts, age 23, serving six months to life for assault with a deadly weapon conviction, was returning to his cell in San Quentin's East Block after dinner when he saw his target. Black convict Charles Kellum, age 28, who was either a BGF member or an associate, I'm not sure of which, was serving a six months to 15 year sentence for a burglary conviction out of Merced County and was headed back to his cell in East Block. Angel initiated his attack on Kellum at the rear of the cell block with a fierro or a shank, and at some point either Angel knocked Kellum down or Kellum fell down and another black convict tossed Kellum a two by two wooden club. Kellum got up and the combat continued. The gun rail officer saw the fight and blew his whistle and commanded them to stop. The officer's verbal warnings went unheeded, so he fired a warning shot, but neither of the combatants stopped fighting. The gun rail officer fired two more shots, hitting Kellum in the right thigh and Angel in the left thigh, ending the battle. In those days, the gun rail officers carried either 30 30 or 30 6 caliber rifles. Kellum was taken to the hospital in serious condition due to multiple stab wounds and a bullet wound in his leg. He luckily would survive his wounds. Angel was taken to the hospital in stable condition for treatment of the bullet wound in his leg and would also survive. Word of this attack quickly spread through the cell blocks. The BGF took the lead and responded for the black convict population, letting it be known to all, especially the Emmett, that someone had to pay for the attack on their comrade. Mexican Mafia founding member, Marcelo Gabi Baeza from Florencia agreed to meet with a group of black leaders on the upper yard the following day, August 30th, 1973, to discuss the situation. This brings me to an assessment made by a correctional officer from that time period based on his observations and interactions with the different races on the yard. This assessment was documented in Ramon Mundo Mendoza's memoir, Mexican Mafia, The Gang of Gangs. He wrote, a guard at San Quentin once shared an interesting observation with me. He said, You can almost always tell when the blacks are up to something because they're loud and they telegraph their intentions. White guys don't talk as loud, but almost as much. But those damn Mexicans, you never know what they're going to do. They're quiet and their faces are unreadable. This dynamic was illustrated in the movie American Me in the fulsome scene where the character named Santana meets the BGF leader, Doc, between their two groups in a Folsom cell block. If you play back the scene, you will see that when the Chicano convicts led by the Mexican Mafia are walking towards the black convicts, they are all quiet with blank expressions on their face. That facial expression is known as a flat affect which is a very severely restricted or non-existent expression of emotion. On the other hand, if you turn to the blacks when they walk towards the Chicanos, they are very vociferous, making aggressive facial and hand expressions. Furthermore, this scene in the movie American Me was also inspired by the showdown between the Emmy and the BGF that we will discuss next. On August the 30th, 1973, at 12.15 p.m., Lieutenant Fon Cannon observed that there were approximately 300 black convicts congregated on the north end of the upper yard, and there were approximately 400 Chicano and white convicts along the east block wall. Lieutenant Fon Cannon was a yard lieutenant and was making his presence known on the upper yard, letting the Chicanos and the blacks know that they were being watched. The gun rail officers were also making their presence known by making it obvious that they were focused on the two opposing groups. Marcelo Gabi Baeza and Raymond Chavo Perez assumed the roles of ambassadors for the Chicano convict population. 
We already know that Gabby from Florencia was a founding member of the Mariposa at DVI in 1957. Chavo Perez from Bakers was state raised and was committed to the California Department of Corrections for an armed robbery conviction out of Bakersfield, California in April of 1970. He was initially housed at the Dual Vocational Institution where his violent and aggressive behavior caught the eye of another founding member of the Mexican Mafia, Richard Richie Ruiz, who was also from Bakers. In 1970, Richie sponsored 12 DVI convicts, including Chavo, into the Mexican Mafia in the largest one-time single recruitment in the history of the M. Today, this is strictly forbidden to prevent a single member from surrounding themselves with a cadre of low soldiers and launching a power grab. Now it's more typical for a carnal to recruit one or two new members during their career. Gabby and Chavo left the Chicano and White group and started walking back and forth on the yard from a north to south direction. They stopped their walk at the north end of the yard where the black group was congregated. Three or four blacks left the larger group, led by BGF member Linwood Bell, age 24, from San Francisco. Bell was first arrested in 1967 at the age of 18 and was convicted of robbery, assault, rape, and sex perversion charges, serving time in the San Francisco County Jail before being committed to the Department of Corrections in 1971 and assigned the number B37564. Gabby took the floor first and told the black reps that if they were insistent in getting revenge for their fallen comrade, why not meet with the Emmy in the gymnasium where there is less guard scrutiny? The numbers would be equal, and they could name how many. Bell apparently took this as a sign of weakness and felt emboldened because he began to curse loudly at Gabby, insisting that someone would have to pay. Gabby made his offer because he knew that the gun rail officers and even the yard lieutenant were watching them, expecting the outburst of hostilities at any minute. Therefore, Gabby knew that any outbreak of hostilities now, while the administration was watching and prepared, would likely not allow him and his brothers to inflict significant damage. However, in the prison gym, they would be able to get busy longer and inflict maximum damage before the administration could restore order. Once Bell finished his tirade, Gabby calmly asked him, Is that the way you want it? And Bell responded, You fucking right, motherfucker. With that, Gabby reached out and grabbed Bell, pulled a bone crusher made from a 12-inch piece of sharpened steel from beneath his coat, and started stabbing Bell in the upper torso as fast as he could. At this point, Chicano and white convicts along the east block wall started advancing towards the blacks gathered at the north end of the upper yard. Lieutenant Von Cannon and other guards assisted from warning shots from the towers and gun rail guards stop them from advancing. Lieutenant Von Cannon then turned his attention to Gabby, who was stabbing Bell with the frenzy of a wild animal. He blew his whistle and yelled at Gabby to stop, but the attack continued. After a warning shot was ignored by Gabby, Lieutenant Von Cannon gave the signal and the gunner shot Gabby in the right leg, ending his ferocious attack on Bell. Two gurneys were brought out that day. One took Bell to the San Quentin Hospital, where he died 30 minutes after being brutally stabbed by Gabby. The other was intended for Gabby's transportation to the hospital for treatment of the gunshot wound in his right leg, but to everyone's surprise, Gabby refused a gurney. Handcuffed and with the assistance of an officer, he hopped off the yard on one leg through a gauntlet of cheering Chicanos and white convicts. I know this sounds like I'm putting jalapeno sauce on the story, but this is coming from men that were present on the yard that day. Gabby was not about to show weakness or let, it, or let anybody even begin to think he was showing weakness. He wanted to show some class and let the guard that shot him know he hadn't done nothing and also let the convicts know that it was no big deal. Seven shanks were found on the yard that day and a lockdown was instituted. The fatal stabbing of Bell was the third fatality of the year and the 43rd stabbing incident. After this incident, Gabby received the additional placaso or alias of Pistolero, or gunslinger, most likely bestowed upon him by the Aryan Brotherhood, who loved to use this Western jargon during this era 
Due to their love of reading Louis L'Amour Western novels, the name was in reference to how Gabby or Pistolero strolled up to the large group of black convicts and had a showdown with their leaders as if he were in the OK Corral. Of course, Pistolero was eventually indicted by the Marin Grand Jury on January the 17th, 1974, for the fatal stabbing of Bell. On January the 21st, 1974, he was arraigned in the Marin Superior Court and entered a not guilty plea. On October the 17th, 1975, after deliberating 19 hours, the jury returned a not guilty verdict. His attorney, Robert D. Carroll, who also represented Luis Bala Talamantes during the San Quentin Six trial, argued successfully that Pistoleto was acting in self-defense when he fatally stabbed Bell to death on the upper yard in San Quentin. Not long after this, Pistoleto made it back to Broadway, a recipient of a RUAP, release upon approval of parole plans as a result of the Nedgley Bill. I was unable to verify any retaliation from the Black Gorilla family, but this doesn't mean there wasn't any response from the BGF. Not all non-fatal stabbings or assaults are reported or recorded by the prison administration. I say non-fatal because if the BGF would have taken out an MM member or an associate, the fatality would have been noteworthy and more than likely reported and recorded by the prison administration. If any of our viewers are privy to information regarding the BGF response, please share it in the comment section. This episode goes to show that life behind the walls is a day-to-day -day survival, and that life is cheap and can be taken from you in an instance. Please take this into consideration before getting involved in that life. Good night and God bless.